Good morning, Lumpo. Good morning, Najan Soko. So today is uh, Saturday, the 14th of August, 2021. It's been uh, a month or so that we haven't uh, done a Q&A, so thank you for giving the opportunity. Today I wanted to ask you about what advice you have to give to young men who come to the monastery, who are inspired by the Buddha's teachings and by the interested in the option of choosing monastic life as a way of living their lives and yet who may feel unsure about whether if they ordain they might be missing out on something in lay life that they still need to live. Would you have anything to say to that? Yeah, well, it's a uh, monastic life is kind of a strong commitment. And uh, It is the value is it get it's a form that is traditional so that it it allows us to kind of adapt to to surrender or adapt to a form that we didn't create that's not based that comes from uh, uh, the tongue of the Buddha and that also gives us a reference point for, for the practice of meditation, for developing awareness, cultivating the path, because the form is, it's a, the whole purpose of the form is to give us a way of living our lives in society uh, that is conducive towards this mindful reflection on the way things are. So it's uh, one misses out on all kinds of things in lay life, but um, you have to determine whether those things are worth one's one's life time you know giving oneself to the sensory pleasures of what we see hear smell taste touch and and uh, ability to do what we want when when we want to where in monastic form with its vinaya its, its disciplinary precepts we have to we we have guidelines for behavior and speech that is not available in lay life. So in terms of freedom of speech, <clears throat> which is very much a subject, controversial subject at this time worldwide, especially in countries like the United States or European Union or Britain, it's, um, you know, how free can one be with one's speech without, you know, and trying to be politically correct and uh, not offend people and not say uh, things that, that, are, that are criticized by the society. And yet we have this idea of I can say what I want. I'm a free citizen in a democratic society, and so we we kind of never really examine our sense of um, cultural identities with our ideals, and uh, we tend to operate from that. So even meditation becomes another thing we must do. And uh, it's good for you. It makes you, you know, relieves you from stress and so forth. So this is taken from a very cultural position, Western culture, where adapting yourself to, to an ancient tradition like 
in Theravada Buddhism as I encountered it in Thailand. Uh, it's, it offered a kind of mirror reflection for my own cultural conditioning because the monastic form in with Lung Kho Cha was very strict and uh, is all, you know, the, the, the moral, the sila, the, the moral precepts are all about behavior, speech and behavior, not about thoughts and emotions. I found this very helpful because in my own cultural conditioning, brought up as a Christian, it was very much the fact that even a bad thought was a sin and doubting was a sin and you know you, you have this whole idea that that life in general is you know if you don't conform exactly to uh, mentally to to the christian doctrines or dogmas then you're a sinner you have to go to confession but in buddha dharma they the sila or the the moral precepts are just about action and speech. I found this very helpful because I'm willing to take responsibility for what I do, physically do with my body and what I say, my speech, where mentally I, I can't take responsibility uh, for everything because uh, one is influenced by so many uh, conditions that change and the moods change and the emotions of, you know, of happiness and sadness change all the time. You can't sustain a, a happy mental emotion for very long before it changes to something else. And uh, through the senses, there's constant distraction and opportunities to, and, and you know, kind of uh, encouragement to follow your desires and do what you want because of this ideal of freedom, where I found living within the structure uh, of a very traditional, uh, clearly defined form, uh, a way of reflecting on cultural conditioning, religious conditioning. And the whole point is uh, that the Buddha established before he passed away, the historical Buddha said, I leave you the Dhamma, which isn't defined. There's no, there's no definition. There's no description of Dhamma and Vinaya. Vinaya is all about condition phenomena, about form, and about how we relate to what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch. And the point is not to just blindly conform out of fear of committing an offense or committing a sin, but to reflect on, on how form is impermanent and changing and not self. So you when you ordained, did you have awareness of all of this or did you uh, feel you had already done what you had to do in lay life and you were ready for monastic life or? Well, I was 31 when I was ordained and so I lived long enough to um, the, the illusions I had about freedom and and self-conceit and making my impression on life as an individual form in society was had completely vanished uh, and uh, i remember thinking uh, at the age of 30 how meaningless life was at 20 i was uh, very eager to go out into the world and live life and learn from life and make my mark and so forth. My 10 years passed by 
with so many kind of experiences, uh, you know, in in so many different directions that I became very confused. By the age of 30, I was an emotionally very confused man and uh, really didn't have any worldly ambitions to fulfill. So when I became a monk, it was, I felt very definitely, uh, this is what I want to do with my life. Because I want to live in a way, I thought, uh, as a layman, uh, from my own parents, I could see that their life was very caught up in, in in kind of uh, working life and family life, everything was was separated from everything else, and and there was always this sense of fatigue and worry and anxiety about the future uh, involved with my way my parents lived, and uh, this you know you began to see that that lay life. Uh, before I any, had any idea of becoming a monk, was was fraught with this anxiety. And I used to watch my mother, you know, in the evenings, sitting in our living room, you know, looking terribly anxious about the future and what's going to happen in the political system and, and to uh, teenage children to look after and and my father having to work at a job he didn't really enjoy doing just to support a family and uh, I thought I would like to live in a different way than just if I could find a way of life that that wasn't divided into compartments and this is what monastic life offers it's it's not compartmental. It's, it's uh, you know, it's it's pretty much this, the one day is the same as the next, and uh, you you don't have the freedom to move about just or distract yourself the way you do when you're living your own life on your own terms. And I found conforming to Vinaya as a good exercise because one thing I could see was was I had a lot of pride and self-conceit that, you know, I learned how as a layman, how to manipulate conditions for my own benefit. And uh, that's my survival tactics from, from the way I was brought up. <clears throat> how to survive in society uh, and feeling quite threatened by society, feeling, you know, you always have to prove yourself in some way, be somebody uh, and achieve and this constant sense of trying to achieve something. <clears throat> Where <clears throat> in monastic life, uh, these tendencies towards achievement become quite obvious as mental conditioning rather than something one operates from, from the sense of I'm this separate form in this vast universe and I have to prove myself and I have to not disappoint my parents. I have to uh, behave according to the laws and yet I'm free to do and say what I want. And there are so many conflicts in the American conditioning where you're brought up with these ideals of democracy and freedom and equality. Uh, you know, they're beautiful ideals that, that uh, one is inspired by these kind of ideals, but the reality of life is an ideal. And this is what disillusioned me by the time I was 30, was that I could see that that uh, daily life was, was never going to, you know, it had moments, the kind of peak moments where it was all, everything was fine and you felt contented and happy and, 
your life was, you're living your life in a good way. But that could easily change. And I found, you know, so much suffering from worrying about what people think of me. A kind of projecting onto others, a kind of negative states, uh, reactions, uh, you know, like wanting people to, wanting to be friendly, but then feeling not confident enough to really be friendly naturally, but to, to promote a kind of uh, personality that was, that was pleasant enough, agreeable enough not to be too offensive. And uh, it wasn't satisfying, wasn't what I really wanted to be, but I didn't really know how, how to deal with it, except through meditation. And through meditation, I remember when I was uh, in the Peace Corps in the early 60s, feeling uh, you know, that I was turned 30 years old and, and 30 more years of just this kind of dreary uh, reactivity that I developed by, in 30 years to life. And the way I saw myself as a person, and I thought 30 more years of just continuing in, with these habits, because they were habit patterns I developed. Uh, and, uh, you know, I thought this is a nightmare. 30 years at that time seemed a long time. Because when you're 30 years old, you're, you're used to the idea of being a young person is is on the edge of middle age, at least from the viewpoint of age 30. Now I look at 30 as being very young. <laughs> they say that changes according to other conditions. So in my Peace Corps days, I uh, sent away to Bangkok to the World Fellowship of Buddhists for Literature, on, on Theravada Buddhism to the Buddhist Publication Society in Kandy, in Sri Lanka, and began to study Theravada Buddhism and uh, took holidays in Thailand from Malaysia and uh, was very much impressed by, uh, you know, the, the, the holidays I spent in Bangkok and in Thailand, which was a very Buddhist country. And so the impression came that this was a good opportunity after my contract with the Peace Corps was fulfilled, I could go to Thailand and find a teacher to learn how to practice, how to put these Buddhist teachings into practice. So these are the teachings, you know, the Dhamma teachings. They're Dhamma teachings. Dhamma is, is not something you can describe. You know, it's a, it's a word that, that uh, we have. We have to accommodate within the English context. Um, so we translate it as absolute, the absolute or ultimate truth. But these are rather abstract definitions of what is the ultimate truth. And so the monastic system as I developed with Lumpur Char was, was learning how to conform to, this, to the designated structure, the traditional structure of Vinaya, at the same time to see through the conforming mechanisms and to be able to to free myself from the uh, see the, the suffering I create just by following old habits uh, since early childhood and adolescence and youth ways of seeing myself in relationship to others I began to 
to observe, to be the, the knower, the, the one that is observing, witnessing these habit patterns. And then the monastic form itself uh, is a constant reminder of, of, to do this, to see through the, the illusions you, you operate from and, and that you developed when you were a layman. So, why wouldn't you have done that for a short period of time and said, okay, now I know how to be happier, I can go back and enjoy lay life? Well, I never, never really wanted to disrobe because I enjoyed monastic life. Because it, it was such a, such a, in many ways, a noble form. You know, and then you're, you're, you know, we can be accused uh, here in England of being selfish, not, you know, just thinking of ourselves, leaving the society. What are we doing to help the society? And uh, because the Western mind thinks like that, that a, that a samana or a monk or a hermit or a holy person is uh, turning his back on society. but. It, in this traditional Theravadan form, you're very much a part of society. You know, like in Thailand, being a, a Westerner, a foreigner in the Thai culture, when I became a monk, I became integrated into Thai culture automatically. Because as a tourist, I was not, I didn't, you know, I felt I was a, a foreign tourist. And the whole relationship with Thailand and Thai people was was very much uh, a feeling of, of uh, alienation or, or strangeness, where by ordaining as a bhikkhu in Thailand, I, I've, you know, I began to see how respected I was for what I was doing. That uh, in Thailand they. 99% of the people would respect the, what I'm doing with my life. And, and even though I, I was a foreigner, they certainly offered their interest and support totally, which really touched, touched my heart very strongly because I wasn't expecting to be so well received and so respected as, a, as an individual. So I began to enjoy the life with, uh, as it was lived in Northeast Thailand with Lung Kho Cha, even though it was very simple. And, uh, you know, many, in many ways, very confusing because your, your whole conditioning has been from Western American civilization, Western culture. And Thai culture is very different as a cultural identity. It's how they respond to life and that it can be quite puzzling uh, in, from the perspective of an American mindset. But I, you know, the life, you meet really fine people like Lung Pho Cha, the monks I trained with in in Thailand, you know, they were, everybody was at least trying, committing themselves to something quite noble, something quite beautiful as a lifestyle. And that was not just kind of training yourself to become a monk and, and uh, something in the society, but to be, develop wisdom in, that isn't about culture and and religion that is natural to this universe that we identify with. Monastic life is, is uh, you have to describe a joy you discovered in monastic life and really enjoying living this life as a monk, but it can't always have been easy. So when you got when life as a monk became difficult and you went through difficulties, what prevented you from saying, okay, I'm out of here, I'm going back to lay life and 
find my way there. Well, I, by the time I ordained, I was so disillusioned with lay life that I never, I couldn't think of anything I'd, else I'd rather do. And in monastic life in the early years as a junior monk, I used to bring up possibilities just to see if they would resonate with me. You know, I just wrote, go back home, uh, you know, and there's nothing that I wanted to do in that way. You know, I didn't have any worldly ambitions, didn't want to get married, didn't want a family, didn't want uh, any kind of professional interest was, was gone. Uh, any sense of achievement? And... A, a sense of achievement. I began to see through all these things. So I, it wasn't that I was just blinded by monasticism. I was, you know, I could bring up possibilities of making lots of money and being able to buy a chateau in France and spend traveling around the world and on a yacht and all the kind of ambitions of, a, of an American mindset, but even at its most best kind of possibilities, I still prefer just monastic life, its simplicity and, and its uh, wholesomeness. What about the sense of fulfillment in a relationship? And that never appealed either. Well, as a layman, I had relationships which were always ended up in some kind of disappointment. And so I, I gave up the idea of finding a perfect relationship because I could see how changeable life is. That it gets unpredictable. And uh, people that you think will you love forever, you know, it doesn't, you can't do that. And uh, at least I couldn't, I could see through how, how tedious just expecting somebody else to, to fulfill your life for me, for you, you know, to make you happy and, and meet all your needs and expecting to find a, the right person that really understands me and and loves me for who I am is in an ideal. And I really saw through that through having been married and various other friendships and relationships that I encountered. You know, as as wonderful as they could be, they could also turn the other way and be kind of disastrous and disillusioning. So um, having a skeptical mind helps because you do tend to become cynical as you grow older. The kind of fairy tale dreams of youth, you know, no, you realize are just that, they're illusions, they're, they're dreams that you have when you're young. And as you experience life, life isn't a dream, it's like this. It's, it's about getting up in the morning, going to bed at night, about surviving, having to eat, having to take care of a, a, of a human body all the time. It gets too hot or too cold or it just gets older and older as the years go by. And uh, the whole illusion of living a happy life uh, as, a, as a lifetime experience, you know, completely fell away, crashed, shattered by just learning enough at the age of 30 to, to realize that how temporary uh, this experience of a physical form and, and mental phenomena, how changeable and uncertain they can be. 
and all your ideals that you form when you're you're young are you know they they inspire you but as you get older they you they, you become cynical about them you realize you know like in the, the american system equality is an ideal but it, and you assume that, that that's the way America operates. But as you grow older, you realize it's not what's really happening. <laughs> and then in terms of Dhamma, you realize condition phenomena is not about equality. You know, physically, we all different, look different. Mentally, we have different aspirations, different fears, different ways of reacting, different social identities, gender identities changing. Now there's so much question about gender identity, you know, whether the transgender or <laughs> homosexuality and so forth is is, uh, you know, it used to be considered sinful. Now it's, it's politically acceptable. But still, the, the mental states about identifying with sexual tendencies, it's all an illusion. Because the sexual, sexuality is a condition that, that we live with. And, uh, but we're not, we're not really sexual. With wisdom, we begin to see sexuality is the nature of the body. Or gender identity is about mental identities. So, you know, the emotional identities, tendencies, attractions, aversions, and so forth that how, how can we can, you know, conform emotionally to a, a, a society that makes everything black and white? You know, it's impossible to do that because uh, black and white are conditions changing. They, there's no permanent black or white absolute condition that you can take refuge in. So to come back to the uh, the original question here, if someone asked you, I'm 20, 25, 30 years old, been here in the monastery, I'm kind of, ordaining looks interesting, but I think maybe I'd need to check out a bit more about lay life. What would you recommend? Well, I wouldn't want to convince them that the only way to live is as a monk. They have to find that out for themselves, really. If they still have longings in lay life and think there's great prospects for happiness in lay life, and they can't see what, that that's a creation of their mind, and it, you know, in, in this life, you point that out, that the possibilities of the future in lay life are just you know, imagination in the present, because in, in monastic life, you're always bringing the reality to the present moment, whatever you're thinking. If I think I'd be happier as a layman, uh, I reckon now I would recognize that as just an imagination, an image that I create in the present and not attached to it. So I find contentment within the life I'm living because uh, the whole aim of Buddhist monasticism is, is contentment. And rather than ambition to get something, become rich or famous or find the right person, these are all desires that drive us into worry, anxiety about the future. Well, the future for a monk 
you know, when we see even seeing the desire to become enlightened is suffering. And that's a noble desire, you know, on the ego level, desire to live the holy life and and obey all the rules and 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 be a, a source of compassion and and goodness in the society is very noble, but it is still words and thoughts and and all about the future, what I'm going to do in the future, or hopefully to attain in the future. Where Lung Po Cha's style of teaching was always in the pointing at the present, the reality of now is like this. And then the the summon of form in this tradition, Theravada Thai Forest tradition, is very much giving you tools to use to to observe desire in all its manifestations. Whether it's noble or base, evil or good or ordinary or you know too much or too little about becoming, about controlling, about destroying evil, all these these kind of ideas and thoughts. Uh, you know, still come to the mind, but you you know what they are. You're no longer dazzled by them or deluded by the way you think or by the society that you're living in. Sometimes in uh, monastic circles, when uh, not necessarily where people are kind of contemplating this option of ordaining or not ordaining, but also just in uh, how much we can just throw ourselves headlong into worldly pursuits or see through that. Sometimes you have this expression, they haven't suffered enough yet. Is that cynical or is it just, is it just realistic? Well, I, and from my own experience, I've suffered enough <laughs> by age 30. But it seems I think that was a blessing. I look back mm -hmm. because you know that was thirty, still pretty young. Yes. And uh, by age thirty, I I had no illusions about worldly life. You know, any kind of hopes or ambitions for worldly success. It's not. Yeah, you know, I can realize I could survive in the world. I knew how to live, uh, you know, how to get along. And, uh, you know, you're living in countries like the United States where they're pretty easy to survive. It's kind of high standard of living and democratic political system. So, you you know, it's it carries you along. But uh, I felt that life had to be there had to be more to it than that, than becoming famous or becoming uh, rich or powerful. I never wanted to be like a politician or have political power to make decisions uh, on political issues. What about just being happy as a lay person? Yeah, that was uh, that was what everybody wants, but I, you know, happiness was uh, so easily destroyed by fears and anxieties and worries that that uh, you know operated, in, you know, in my mind that could destroy happiness, momentary happiness. And then you have to find what is, you know, it, you know, as William Blake said in one of his reflections, contentment is a, is heaven itself. And I used to be a great enjoyer of William Blake's poetry. Contentment is heaven itself or contentment is the highest happiness. 
and in the American conditioning, contentment wasn't a part of the goal in life, but a, a success, prosperity, good health, eternal youth. These were the these were the role models held up to me, and so, and then the Christian conditioning of feeling a sinner having a strong sense of guilt about being a human being, about sexual desires, about, uh, you know, feeling angry or jealous, you know, feeling, feeling a lot of guilt because these are all sinful conditions. And so you're, you're brought up with this kind of fear and, and that you're going to have to pay a price or mistakes you've made in life. And uh, so, you know, you do have moments of contentment. I remember even in the Navy, uh, the US Navy, I had moments of contentment, but you know, they didn't last. And uh, they were very dependent upon conditions being uh, seemingly just right, where you feel contentment because the things around you are, are content you. You feel content with them, but then they change. Where in monastic life, things change just the same, like from Thailand to England to, uh, you know, to where uh, culture changes, the weather changes, the, the monks, the nuns come and go, ordained, disrobed, and you know, you you have to experience these changes, some for the better, some for the worse, but in the, with a contented mind, it not, you don't feel anything, but you're not making problems about the way things are, because you're you're letting life flow through you rather than trying to control it and bend it to your will, which is an impossible act. You can't do that. Thank you for these reflections, Rupal. My pleasure. <laughs>